Let's get started for today. Um, welcome to our 23rd lecture. Announcements, your project five is due tomorrow at 5 p.m. Your homework nine will go out soon. It'll cover largely what we covered in Tuesday's lecture. And then on Saturday, there's a open house in the robotics lab that I run, so feel free to stop by, see the robot, do all kinds of tricks, including high-fiving, hugging, and tying knots. Final contest is underway. Um, first preliminary ranking will be made on Sunday. Try to get in by then. Um, this is optional, but a lot of fun and can get you extra credit, which we broke down last time. Many ways to get extra credit. Highest chance if you start early. Any questions about logistics? Okay, then start our second lecture on deep learning. And first thing I want to do is show you a little demo site. So this was just released a couple of days ago. And this allows you to play around with different machine learning algorithms. For example, we have here a data set. One class in yellow, another class in blue. There's x1 as input and x2. And then we have one neuron, so this corresponds to a perceptron. And then we can say, well, let's train the weights for this thing. Um, so here you see it training the weights. This is what it, let's reset this. So starting from nothing, training the weights. You see how it finds some kind of decision boundary, which isn't great because there's no way to separate this with a linear decision boundary, but that's what it converges to. You can pick different data sets. For example, this one here. Um, what do you expect to happen here? This is more or less linearly separable, so it'll probably find something that matches that. And indeed, after just a few updates, it's able to find a good decision boundary here. Um, let's go to another one. How about this one here? What do you think will happen if we train a perceptron? What will the decision boundary look like? So you want to be accurate. So most of the time you hope you get it right. That's hard to do here with a linear decision boundary and just the x1, x2 coordinates. Um, let's take a look at what happens. It's minimizing its training loss, hopefully also minimizing test loss, not as well, but here's what happens. So it essentially singles out one cluster of the blues off to the side, so it gets those correct most of the time, and the other side, two-thirds of the time, it's yellow, so two-thirds of the time, it gets it correct on the other side. Um, if you want to do better, you can play around here with um, adding hidden layers. Let's add a hidden layer. Let's add some extra neurons in there. We know what this can do. This can create features that are learned from the data that can then be used by linear classifier, which is sitting in the next layer, to try to classify the data. So let's see what happens here. It actually learns something pretty good for this data. You can look at more complex data. Um, how about a spiral? You can see what happens. Let's train. See how the decision boundary evolves. Um, it's harder to train for this. It's difficult to get that. It doesn't necessarily have the expressiveness right now. Maybe it cannot express a decision boundary that matches this. So maybe we'll add some more neurons here. Add two more. Reset. See what happens. Still having a hard time fitting to this. Maybe we add more or maybe we say, well, instead of adding more neurons, instead let's, uh, in the second layer, let's just add more layers. So let's make this a little bigger, make it more express expressive, um, see what happens now. Still having a hard time, this is very difficult data to fit because the data is very much interleaved. Maybe we can, uh, so it's getting somewhere. could also try to help it a little bit. We can introduce extra features, but let's see how far it goes this way. It's starting to curve something in there. So keep, we could keep adding neurons and hopefully it would start finding it, or we could also add some extra features like x1 squared, x2 squared, x1 times x2, sine of x1, sine of x2. Let's see what happens now. 
it's oscillating a little bit, so, but it's actually trying to fit that spiral. It's actually not doing too poorly. Um, we might have to play with the learning rate a little bit and other things at the top here, but you can see how this allows you to just toy around with different data sets, different neural nets, and see what happens, different features you feed in, and also with some of the hyperparameters. So there's also linked from the slide deck. If you want to play around with this yourself, look for the link in the slides and try it out. This is powered by uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow, some people will mention later, it's uh, Google's deep learning library that's been released to the world um, for anybody to use. Okay, so that was playground.tensorflow.org. Let's get back to the math that we were doing. So, our starting point was the perceptron. And our objective initially was classification accuracy. And this could be measured this way. How often is the sign of W transpose F of XI equal to the label negative one or positive one YI? Issue with this is that we have many plateaus. If you want to optimize W, a small change in W might not result in any change in accuracy. That's a problem because now you don't know which direction to change W. Why is that? Because to change accuracy, you actually need to change W sufficiently well that one of the trading points changes its classification. And that's going to be happening at discrete points, not continuously changing the score. So we said, we can fix this. We can have something that's more of a continuous loss by saying we're going to score for label y equal 1 with w transpose f of x and negative w transpose f of x for the other label. And then we can soft score this by defining a probability of y equal 1, that is e to the score for y equal 1, and then the score for y equal negative 1 is e to the score for y equal negative 1, and then we renormalize dividing by the sum of these two. That gives us a likelihood. This likelihood will change continuously. As you slightly change the weight vector, the likelihood will slightly change too. Often we work with the log likelihood rather than the likelihood because numerically that tends to be better conditioned. And so we could build networks this way. Um, not only do we want this smoothing here at the end, we want it in all units. The typical thing to be put there is a tan h, which looks like this, which rather than flipping between negative one and positive one at zero instantaneously, smoothly goes from negative one to positive one uh, based on the activation. We can build bigger networks. Um, we can also do this for multi-class. Let's say there is more than two classes. We can have a weight vector for each of the classes. So by example here, for three classes, we'll have a weight vector W, A, W, B, W, C, one for each possible class. And then again, we can think of this as our score for class A for input f of x. Then, of course, class B and class C will have their score. We renormalize by the sum of the scores, and this gives us then the probability that the label is A given feature vector and weight vector. Of course, the weight vector needs to be trained for this to be meaningful. So this is our objective then, product of the probabilities of the labels given the corresponding data. And then we typically take the log of this because that's easier to work with. So that's our setup. That's what we're working with. Um, the way we found good parameters W, um, so we can build networks. Actually, yeah, let's, let's step into this in a little bit of detail. So what does a network look like when you have this multi-class softmax with weights for each class? Now you'll have multiple outputs in your network. One output for each class, scoring that class. And so the weight vector WA lives here, here, and here. It lives on everything that's coming into the score that's being computed here for A. Similarly for weight vector for B and for C. The earlier ones are still just computing features that are being learned based on whatever is useful uh, to get high accuracy or good training loss. And so the score for A here, for B here, C here. And so as you have more classes, will be more outputs. There's still a single objective. The objective is the probability of the labels or the log probability of the labels given the inputs and the weight factor. Question? Um, is there a reason why some of the arrows are like bolded and some aren't? Or is that oh, yeah, that's a good question. So what I did in the drawing here is I indicated that these weights could be higher valued or lower valued, and if it's a higher valued weight, then it'll be a stronger connection. 
bigger channel between those and that's a thicker arrow. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess, artistic freedom or whatever. It's, it's not accurate in any particular way. These are not necessarily the right weights. It's just to indicate that the weights will not be all the same. Yes? So for the, for the first layer, the second layer, shouldn't all the weights from one section of the first layer be the same? Because the second layer is not a single uh, value, which is the uh, saturation. The same. Should the weights here be the same? Oh, sorry, I'm next level. Next level? So all the weights being uh, output from a single perception, shouldn't they be the same weight? In the back here? Or, or where are you In the here? Yeah. So for that bottom perception, shouldn't all the weights coming from that be identical? So what this is indicating is there's a feature being computed here. That feature has a value based on the input. That feature, maybe it's, is there a vertical edge in the image? Might it, might fire on that. Then this is saying that for class A, presence of a vertical edge is very important. Uh, for class B, presence of a vertical edge is also very important. But for class C, presence of a vertical edge is not important and maybe even negatively important. You don't want it. Mm -hmm. So that's what this the same feature is going to all of them, but the weights are different. But different classes will have different weights for each feature because it might matter differently to different classes whether a feature is present or not. Of course, a lot of weights in there, hard to set by hand. We now have a differentiable objective though, so what we can do is slightly wiggle the weights, see which direction is better, take a step and repeat. In fact, we'd like to step in the steepest descent direction on our loss function. So we have a training data set, we have a loss defined on that training data set, we try to minimize that loss, while of course also tracking what happens on the holdout data so to make sure we don't overfit. But what would be plotted here is training data loss, and we want to descend on that to find a minimum. How do we find the steepest descent direction? We looked at some math for that, and we found that you essentially need to step in the negative gradient direction. So the gradient is this vector that has derivatives of the objective with respect to each of the parameters. And so more generally, if we had more parameters, we'd build a vector with derivative of the objective, in this case called g, with respect to each of the weights that we have in our parameter vector. This could be a billion weights, this could be at least a few hundred million and so forth. So this is what we want to compute to then take a step in the right direction. We also looked at when you have that direction, what do you do with it? You actually need to be careful about how far you step. You could overstep. It's not because currently it's steep going downhill in a certain direction that you should step super, super far in that direction because things might might start going back up. So you need to be careful about how far you step. That's your step sizing parameter alpha over here, your learning rate. In addition, it could be we saw that you step in a direction and then step back and keep oscillating back and forth because in that direction things are a very steep, you're faced with a very steep valley, but in another direction it sloped very gently. And this discrepancy between how different directions are sloped and how quickly it changes, effectively how quickly the gradient changes, so how high the second derivative is in each direction, affects how far you want to step. And a simple procedure to account for that is to introduce momentum, where you, instead of stepping in the gradient direction, negative gradient direction, you keep track of a velocity. That velocity is whatever it was before, but scaled down a little bit, and then adjusted by the negative gradient direction. And then you step in that velocity direction. And so now you wouldn't oscillate back and forth the same way anymore. You'd actually, that would average out in this velocity calculation and would give you a better direction ultimately. So effectively it's measuring, it's accounting for the fact that your gradient can change and finding an averaged version of your gradient over recent points that you visit where you calculated your gradient and you step in that average gradient direction. Consequence here is that you start having hyperparameters. Aside from hyperparameters related to worrying about overfitting, that's one thing, you don't want to overfit, you need to check your holdout data and so forth. Just to run your optimization procedure on your training data to bring down your loss, you need to pick a good alpha, you need to pick a good mu, and there will be more of those coming up. So one thing you could do is you could say, well, I'm going to try uh, 
a bunch of settings for alpha, a bunch of settings for mu, and then see what works. But the question is, what does that mean to try a bunch of settings for one hyperparameter, a bunch of settings for the other one? You first tune the first hyperparameter, then the next one. It might be that the joint setting is what makes it work. It might also be that some hyperparameters are not very sensitive to what you do. And so the canonical thing to do, a very simple thing, would be to use a grid layout. And you'd say, well, I have one parameter, another parameter, and I disc take discrete points, and then I try each one of those, fire up multiple processes, and see whichever process does best. And that's my setting. Now, what people have found is that this kind of systematic gridding is actually not the way to go. The reason it's not the way to go is because often when you have hyperparameters, some of them don't matter as much as others. Even sometimes you have some that don't matter at all. And let's say you had a completely unimportant parameter here, and you're gridding, then effectively all you get is measurements here, here, and here. Whereas if you instead randomly sample in this space, and still this thing doesn't matter, you actually get coverage here, 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 and so forth. And you actually find this peak where things work best for the parameter that actually matters. And so somehow by doing things randomly, you're favoring your outcome here and you have a higher chance of finding something good. That's something to keep in mind. It's actually a pretty recent uh, thing people started doing just in 2012 and this paper is reported, kind of a good explanation of why you'd want to do random uh, uh, gridding, so not really gridding anymore, rather than a regular grid. Before we dive into some of the missing pieces of the math, I want to show you some things these neural nets can do. Um, I showed you some plots last time about how deep learning has enabled very rapid progress in supervised learning and classification in image recognition and speech. Let's look at some examples. So this is from the Krzyzewski paper that was the big breakthrough paper that uh, we referenced last time. Um, here are images. The neural net trained in there, called AlexNet, is actually able to recognize and score what's an image. You see it's actually quite good in terms of recognizing. You see what here, convertible, indeed, highest score, um, and so forth. Similarly, instead of just classifying images that are fed to it, you could also do retrieval. You could go out and uh, provide an image, and then you could ask it to find the most similar images. If you do this at a pixel level, that's not going to work. But if you do this in this deep neural net, in the right before last layer, where all these interesting features are living, if you compute those features, look at that vector, and then find other images that are very similar in that vector, you'll find things that are visually the same. So it's really interesting. It really understands what images are similar to each other, which would be completely impossible at the pixel level. Detection, rather than being given an image and saying, what's an image? Given an image, can you find things in the image? Um, there's also very recent results from 2015. Um, so it can find a person, a horse, it can find a dog, another person in the back, a car. This is all possible now. Um, if you look at things over here, it's not just finding bounding boxes, it's actually understanding what space is really taken up by each of these things. Gray is road, deep is road there. And if you look at things like a uh, building in the background, that is marked correctly in the building color. There's green trees. That's marked correctly. It's not perfect, but it's getting pretty close to showing a really good understanding of where everything is in the image and what it is. Here's some other recent results. Uh, predicting where objects are on the road, very important for self-driving cars, right? Um, in fact, NVIDIA is putting a lot of effort into this in building embedded computing platforms that are low power, can go into a car, and they don't necessarily need to do training, they just need to do test calculations. And so you can have a cheaper board, more power <laughs> efficient that just does test calculations, um, and the training is happening somewhere ahead of time in the cloud with a lot more compute power. Here's another example. Uh, understanding a face in detail for the top row, then you can also apply this to actually footage, so video, you can apply this to um, detection of street numbers. So it's based on a Google Street View data set. Google went out and collected a lot of images in the streets, right? You've seen Street View. Then they hired people to label house numbers because they want their maps to be very accurate. But of course, 
it's very expensive to hire people to label every single image that they collect. So they said, let's hire a bunch of people who label a bunch of these. And then after that's been done, let's train a deep neural net that understands how these digits are recognized and then label the remainder ones automatically. Recognizing the details of a person, not just where a person is, but also their limbs, their body posture. Um, learning to play Atari games was a big breakthrough result by DeepMind, the company in London, since acquired by Google for about $600 million um, uh, on learning to play Atari games. We'll look at that a little more next lecture. Recognizing things in um, images of uh, biological test beds. Doesn't need to be digits, it can be Chinese writing, it can be uh, traffic sign recognition, which is again really important for autonomous cars, which are gonna be a major application for AI in the near future. Um, this here, um, what you're looking at here is actually slices of the brain. And there's a major project going on where people are trying to understand how the brain is wired. So 100 billion neurons, 10,000 connections per neuron, something like that. So huge, huge network. Um, if you image a brain, let's say of a mouse, something like that, can you automatically process these images to understand where each neuron is running and then reconstruct the neural wiring diagram to better understand how the brain works. And so neural nets are used, kind of finally neural nets are used to see what human neural nets uh, are structured as. There's also recognition in text that can even be marked up. So things are really starting to work in many, many places thanks to these techniques. Um, whale recognition, this is actually, you're supposed to recognize an individual whale, understand this is whale, whatever the whale's name is, as opposed to another whale, and track them. So the idea is that you track over time what their migration patterns are, where they are, and so forth. Um, recognizing where streets are from satellite imagery. Again, a big neural net trained from example data where this was annotated by hand to then do this on new data. Image captioning. This is actually taking it to a whole new level. And this was a, uh, a big breakthrough in 2015. In fact, at the time, the New York Times covered this. There were, interestingly, something like six or eight labs, including a lab at Berkeley, a lab at Google, one at Facebook, one at Stanford, and so forth, that actually all got essentially the same idea and a similar result right at the same time. And the result that they all got was that rather than just labeling what's in an image, learning to describe with a full sentence what's in an image. For example, the system gets fed the picture at the top left and produces as its output a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Um, here, second one gets the image, it says two dogs play in the grass. Maybe the third one's not playing. Um, maybe it made a mistake. I mean, these things aren't perfect yet. Um, but that's the kind of result these systems are able to get. And this is amazing, because now it's not just vision anymore. It's vision and language. It's actually expressing some understanding of what's in these images. That's well beyond just a label. Bottom right is a funny one, of course. Yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. Um, that's not a school bus. But this should give you some idea of the level of performance these systems are tar starting to get. That's not bad. I mean, it's a taxi, well, not exactly a school bus, but it is still something that drives around and it's parked and it gets the right gist. More work to be done, maybe just label more data, it'll just do the job. Maybe more technical innovation needs to happen, not clear. Then people start doing art with this, because the natural thing people say, well, AI can do this, AI can do that, but they never do art. Um, sure enough, um, not too long ago, it's a project that, uh, at, yeah, blanking on exactly who did this, but this is the, the link to find out where it was done. And so what's being done here is you, you can take an image of anything. I can take an image, classroom, whatever, snap an image, and then I take a piece of art, a Van Gogh, a Monet, whatever it is that you like the style of, and then it'll turn that image into the style of that art piece. And actually, the way it does it is, if you look at the deep neural net, if the deep neural net calculates these layers of features on your image, you could look at image statistics. You could say, how often, let's say, are there vertical edges, horizontal edges, blurry things, and so forth. 
And so what it does, it actually starts moving the image that you just snapped towards having the higher order statistics of the art style that you're interested in. And so then it'll, it'll, the high level concept stays the same. It's still a person, um, it's still a landscape and so forth, but it starts evolving more locally the higher order statistics of the features towards what's in the art style you like, and you get things like this. There's been a lot of progress here. A um, few remaining pieces we have to cover. I should warn you, we're gonna go a little bit faster than we usually go, because I think it is really interesting to see the whole picture here of what's going on with deep learning, which has really revolutionized what's been happening in AI in the last two to five years. Um, the way we're gonna make up for going a little faster in lecture is that you will have a homework specific to lecture, Tuesday's lecture and another homework specific to today's lecture. So there'll be more homework on this to give you more time to absorb everything. And we'll also incorporate some of this into your project six, which used to not have this, but we'll actually bring TensorFlow into your project six, another way to learn even more, okay? Um, but things will go just a little bit faster than usual, but Hopefully this, combined with the homework and project, everything together works out well and you can really understand all of this. So these are the key ideas we haven't covered yet to get these things to work. There's one thing that's interesting to keep in mind is actually that neural nets have been around since the 50s. And it's only recently that there are major breakthroughs that things are starting to work. There are a lot of reasons for this. One of them is more data. Another one is more compute power. But another one is also you need to get a lot of the details right for these things to work. And if you don't get the details right, it'll learn nothing. And it'll just apply very high loss and that's it. And so let's look at some of the specifics here that you need to get right to make these things work. First thing, this is true for all machine learning objectives, supervised learning objectives, that they're very often of this format here. You have a log likelihood, and so you look at the average log likelihood of the probability of a training label given the corresponding features. And of course that depends on the weight factor that you're using and you want to maximize this or you want to minimize the negative of this. If you have a lot of data, let's say you have a million labeled examples or maybe a billion labeled examples. This thing would say cycle through all your data, compute the, you would compute the derivative for each one of those terms because your gradient would be the sum of the derivatives of each one of those terms. And then finally you'd have your gradient. You could take a step, then you'd cycle all your data again, compute derivatives, have a gradient again. And cycling through all the data to just get one gradient can be very time consuming, so it's take forever for each gradient step. Now, if you think that maybe there's a little bit of redundancy in your data, it's not that there's actual redundancy, but there is similarity because there's a pattern there, it could make a lot of sense instead of cycling through all your data from one through M to only go from one through K. Look at that as your current objective, a small subset of your data, compute the gradient on that, take a step, and then typically after that you'd switch to another subset of size K, compute a gradient again, and repeat. And so this way, once you've done one pass through your data, if you have, let's say, your data split in a thousand batches, you actually end up with a thousand gradient steps in one pass rather than one gradient step per pass through your data. In the extreme, you make your batch size k equal one. And so now for any time you visit a data point, you compute a gradient direction, you can take a step. In practice, there are other considerations because there's parallelization and often you can very on a GPU efficiently parallelize some of this. And so a batch of one might not be the fastest because in principle you could do maybe like 200 something in parallel in one pass through your GPU pipeline and so you do a batch of whatever might fit in there in one pass through equally fast as passing just one thing through. But the important idea here is that passing through your entire data set for getting a gradient and repeating is too time consuming. You want to split this in smaller chunks and cycle over them. I want to be careful when you split this in smaller chunks that you randomize your data. Let's say your first thousand things are all cars, your next thousand are dogs, your next thousand are cats. 
You don't want your first batch to be all dogs and the next batch again all dogs and so forth and finally then all cars, all cars, or all cars. Because then this average here will not be representative of the average you're trying to compute. So randomize the order in which your data is set up and then sample from it batches and then you'll get often a good estimate of the actual gradient even from a small batch. Okay, we check this one off. Improving generalization. Generalization is always the most important thing in machine learning. You train on your training data, we have this log likelihood, we optimize on the training data, but at the same time, so what will happen is you are running your algorithm, right? This is iterations, and this would be loss, and hopefully this thing would kind of make its way down for you. But if this is train loss, Actually, that's not enough to bring the training loss down. I mean, it's a good thing if that goes down, but it's not what you ultimately care about. So you'd also want to look at your holdout loss, and maybe your holdout loss goes something like this, and here starts going back up. And you'd probably want to stop somewhere here, whatever the parameters are there. Now, question is, beyond just stopping early, are there other things we can do to generalize better, to learn something that's better than just optimizing directly the parameters in our neural net? Dropout is one idea that actually makes a big difference in pretty much everybody's experience when, when using it. Um, here's a standard neural net laid out vertically now. Dropout says, let's just zero out a bunch of stuff. Why would you do this? Imagine you're doing image recognition. You're trying to recognize a cat, but maybe the cat is hiding behind the leg of a chair, partially. And so now part of the cat is not visible. You still want to recognize it. And so zeroing out pixels not being able to rely on them is a very meaningful thing to do and still expecting the neural net to predict the right thing. Similarly, for higher level features, maybe you have a detector for an eye that's living in a higher level feature somewhere. Zeroing that out is not a bad thing to do. You want to be robust to that because that eye could be a clue to it. Maybe it's closed or maybe there's something in front of it. And so what this effectively is doing is saying you want to be robust to things going missing. For images, often due to occlusions. Okay, let's say you do that, what, and you drop this out, you effectively have another neural net. In this new neural net, you can update the parameters. And then what you would do in dropout is you would actually do this for your current mini batch or your current one sample if you do stochastic gradient descent. And then when you go to the next bunch of data, you actually drop out different things. And you, si you randomly drop things out at some rate, kind of half, dropping out half of the units in each layer is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, how could this be a good idea? Here's a, a detailed explanation. Let's say there are all these things that could tell you that something is a cat. You actually don't want to rely on all of them being present, things dropping out, whether it's in text, in images, and so forth. You should be robust to that. Um, another interpretation is that you're actually training a large ensemble of models. It's like you're not training one neural net anymore. You're training this large ensemble of every possible dropped out version of that original architecture. And then you're trying to see what, and they all share parameters of course, because they're all coming from the same neural net, and you're hoping that that will do better. And in practice for pretty much any machine learning type competition, it's been found that if you run a lot of machine learning algorithms, and then somehow pool what they learned, you do better than just trying to have just one approach win out point blank. And so this is one way to have a single neural net build an ensemble over effectively many neural nets and get a vote over what these many neural nets are thinking. Um, at test time, what do you do? Should you drop out at test time? Well, it's not that clever to drop out at test time because if you have information there, you want to use all of the information that's there. You don't want to drop out. So one thing you can do is say, well, let's sample a lot of dropout networks. We'll sample a few thousand of them, run a prediction with each one of them, average or vote among them, and then make a decision. But that's expensive, because now at test time, you're running a thousand times forward inference to find a thousand predictions and then pooling that. So instead of doing at test time, the sampling-based approach was typically done is you actually use the original network, but you account carefully for what the difference is between train and test. So let's take a look at this very simple neural net here. Actually, while we're at it, let me give credit to these people over here. 
Fei-Fei Li, Andre Karpathy, and Justin Johnson. Um, they teach a class on uh, deep learning over at Stanford, and they were very generous to kind of let me borrow a bunch of their slides. I should also say, if you want to learn a lot more about this, there's 14 lectures there, and the class is called CS231N, and it's actually really, really well done. So if you want to learn more beyond the two lectures we can do here, this would be my recommended starting point. Okay, back to the neural net here. So what do we have here? Very simple neural net, two inputs, and then an output unit. What would be, so question, suppose that with all inputs present at test time, the output of this neuron is X. What would its output be during training time in expectation if we drop half of the units, this layer? So at test time, we get X. What do you think we'd get at training time? Well, let's take a look at this. At training time, we flip a coin for every unit, whether it gets dropped or not. So we have a possibility that um, both of them get dropped. Possibility that only the first one gets dropped. Possibility that only the second one gets dropped. Possibility that none of them get dropped. Each has equal probability. And so if we average the score, the average score that we would get at training time is half of the score that you get by just doing a straight through calculation. Half because we drop with probability P equals 0 0.5. And so effectively what we see is we need a score adjustment of 1 over P. When we train with dropout probability P, we need a score adjustment of 1 over P to make this work out. Why is this important, you say? What if we just rescale our output? Is that really an issue? It actually is, because you have this deep net, and there are nonlinear activations there, and you might start saturating things up to the right or up to the left by scaling things up when they originally they were scaled down by a factor two. So it does matter that you get this scaling correct. Otherwise, this actually wouldn't work out. At this time, things just wouldn't do so well. But it's very easy to do. Just remember what your dropout probability P was, rescale your calculations by that, all you need to do. So very simple trick, often improves your accuracy by two or three percent. And just takes a couple lines of code, all you need to do, all of a sudden, two to three percent more accuracy. Okay, so we've seen this part, we've seen improving generalization with dropout. You still have to do holdout evaluation and so forth, of course. That doesn't go away. It's just something that helps in addition to that. Let's take a look at activation functions. So here are these standard activation functions people tend to use these days. Let's, this is the one we've been talking about, 10H, right? What, what is this? On the horizontal axis here, you have your W transpose feature input, and then that gets squashed between negative, between negative one and positive one by this 10H function. First question, why would you even do this? Why do we have those nonlinear activations living there? Because if you keep everything linear, then you have linear, 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 composing of linear things gives you something linear, and effectively you still just have a perceptron. You can't do anything. By composing linear things, all you get is something linear. You gain nothing from having this big neural net. You need the nonlinearity in there to get more expressiveness, to get decision boundaries that you couldn't get with uh, just a linear classifier. Of course, then what nonlinearity do you put there? This one's been very popular for a long time. Um, here's another one that looks very similar, but it's shifted. It's shifted up. It's called a sigmoid. It's kind of the same thing because a tanage is e to the x minus e to the negative x over e to the x plus e to the x. These two are very related. They're just shifted versions of each other. The downside of the one at the top is that your outputs are always positive, which is actually not that well, not that good a conditioning for your optimization problem. If you set it up this way, it'll be harder to get your gradient descent uh, or your momentum to converge to the optimum that you want to get to. And so it's better to use something like this. The zero centering really helps the optimization. Here's another one that's being used. In fact, this one has been around for a long time, but the 2012 Shishevsky paper really put this one as the map that since then, most people are using. Um, why? Why would you use this thing? It seems less interesting than the one before it, than the 10H. Um, but here's an issue with the 10H that can come up. If you're out here or out here, you're actually on a plateau. 
Not exactly, there's still a little bit of slope because it asymptotes to one or negative one. It doesn't actually hit one or negative one ever before it reaches infinity. But the slope is very, very shallow. Keep in mind that you have this like very, very tiny signal then here when you're out there. That tiny signal will not make it through when you have a lot of data, some noise in your data and so forth, and you might not get a good gradient signal. Okay? So it turns out we'll look at this to get these 10 edges to work. You need to be really careful about how you initialize and make sure you're most of the time or at least a good fraction of the time in that regime so you get a good signal. But then people have often started to switch to these ones here where you actually only saturate on one side. You saturate here, your gradient signal will be zero when you're there, but over here, the gradient never becomes zero. You never get a plateau. Now, here it's still zero, so you can make a small fix to this and have a small slope over here to still get some signal on, on that side. That's called the leaky rectifier, rectified linear unit. R-E-L-U is rectified linear, linear unit. And so this is the leaky version. This could be the equation here with the max. Um, that might even work better. There are some fancy things like max out that let's not get into the specifics of those. And then ELU are a lot like this thing over here, but now it's made soft. It's smoothed out rather than having this hinge at zero. And so there's a little more signal there too. <clears throat> For this class, we'll largely work with this one over here, though you're welcome, of course, to toy around with any of the other ones if you want to. So activation functions, done too. Let's now, now take a look at initialization and batch normalization. So here's the, here's the thing. When you run these things, let's say you put some weights in there, random weights, that's your starting point. You now compute your gradient. I haven't yet said how we do that efficiently, but we'll get to that. You compute your gradient. Um, if you initialize poorly, that gradient will effectively be zero. You'll have get no signal because you will be over here or over here or with this one, you'll be over here. It won't always be there, but you'll be there too often. And if you are, if for example, for any unit, you're always in the plateau regime, there's no signal there and that unit will never change. There's no incentive to change what it's doing because it says, oh, any change has zero effect on what I do, so I shouldn't change my weights. And so you need to be really careful that you land in a regime where these things have a non-zero slope. Doesn't mean you need to be on a non-zero slope for every single training example, because a cat might need to activate different features than a dog, but over your training corpus, it needs to be the case that on average, when you feed all your training data through, that each unit is active a good fraction of the time, meaning each unit is in a good part of the regime a good fraction of the time, so each unit gets signal about in which direction to move its weights. So how to do that? So what if we just initialize with zero? Then we're right in the middle, not a bad thing maybe. Um, any thoughts about that? Some issues with that. If you initialize with zero, then what happens is all your neurons are initialized the same way. There's no symmetry breaking. And so what happens is you kind of get, it's the same as having only one neuron in each layer because they'll all do the same thing. And so you don't get a very rich representation. So you need something that breaks symmetry. Even though zero is kind of the close to where you kind of want to be because that's where that good slope is, you don't want to be all zeros either. So reasonable thing to do is to initialize with some random numbers that are pretty small. So you're close to zero with your weights, but you're not exactly zero. It's random, so it'll make every unit be having its own identity and be able to do its own thing. Okay, it's okay for small networks, but the problem is if you inspect carefully what happens with a deep network when you do this, is that actually the activations you get are not what you want. So let's take a look at this. Here's some code that runs the experiment. And here we go from, we have in this case 10 layers. And we can see if we have random weights, Gaussian random weights sitting everywhere. What happens is the mean is pretty good. It's around zero, so this propagation stays around zero, which is what we want. We want to be in that part of the space. But if we look at the standard deviation of the activations of the units, we see it drops as you go from layer one through layer 
for zero through layer nine, you go from a reasonable standard deviation where you see some range of activations to essentially always seeing a zero activation. Why is that happening? Well, you have random activations, this kind of random propagation. If you think of this in terms of um, just random matrix theory, what happens is you'll get some things to shrink, some things to grow. Um, the things that grow get capped by the negative one, positive one uh, saturation, so they don't grow nearly as much as the things that shrink, and overall, things get smaller and smaller, and you get very little signal, very little activation towards the end. So you need to be careful. Even though this was a good initialization for the first and maybe first two layers, you need to think about what you do for the later layers to still make this work. Um, so, of course, the problem again, if activations are zero, the gradient will be zero, you don't learn anything. Um, so we don't want that. So here's what you can do instead. You can do it based on the amount of inputs and outputs your channel has. So if you know how many inputs and outputs a channel has, you can compute an expectation of what will happen there, and you can make sure it gets activated the right amount of time, because you said there's a Gaussian input vector, I have this many Gaussian inputs. If I take a weighted sum of that, that will be my output. I can rescale accordingly and repeat through the network. So that's what's being done in practice. You have initialization that looks like this. Um, it essentially divides by the square root of the number of inputs. And if you divide, by the, so you sample from a Gaussian, the standard deviation of that Gaussian is scaled by the square root of the number of inputs. And so if a, a weight that lives in a, that goes into a neuron that has a lot of inputs, each of the weights will be relatively small. If a neuron has only one input, then that weight will be initialized with a larger standard deviation when it's being sampled. If you switch from the tan H units, units to the rectifier units, actually this breaks, you need to make a correction here because they behave differently. And so there's a paper that came out quite recently that shows how to do this. You might say, there's a paper, oh my god, that's like you write a paper about just rescaling something by a factor two. But actually these things matter. And uh, in practice you need to get all these things right to get these things to work. And so it's a really interesting finding that this is the way you would initialize um, in case you use these rectifiers rather than um, you using the tan H units. And so here's some learning curves that result from that. Um, if you look at this, if you initialize right, this is the learning curve you get. If you initialize wrong by that factor two, you just flatline, it doesn't go down. You get no signal because the activations are zero, gradient zero, you don't know where to go. That's just still an area of research to figure out exactly what the best way is to initialize these. Um, let's see, let's take a break here. After the break, let's take a look at the next generation of these things. Let's restart. Any questions about the first half? So some questions that came up during the break, just as a reminder, when I say gradient, the gradient vector is this thing over here. The gradient vector is a vector, in this case your objective is g, g is a function that depends on a vector w, and the gradient vector has one entry for each entry in the vector w. The first entry in the gradient vector is the derivative of g with respect to w1. So that is, you have this function g that depends on many, many variables, w1, w2, up to wn. You're at a current point, the current setting of w1 through wn. At that point, you say, let's fix w2, w3, and so forth. Let's only let w1 vary. So we make it into a one-dimensional function just of w1, compute the derivative of that one-dimensional function right there. That derivative is the first entry in your gradient. Same thing for the second entry. You'd say, I'm fi fixing everything except for w2. Now this function g becomes a function of just w2 because everything else is fixed. I can look at that function, 
That's a one dimensional function now. I can look at the derivative at the current w2, and that is the second entry in this gradient vector, and so forth. So it's measuring the slope along each of the coordinates that you have in your variable, that variable vector that you're optimizing over. And we'll, we'll get soon to how to compute that. Um, that's the backprop thing we still have to do. Um, initialization. So very important. Why? If you initialize poorly, activations will be zero, meaning a lot of the neurons will always have output a zero. And it turns out if these neurons output a zero because they're in a saturated regime, right? Sorry, not zero. They output, they're in a saturated regime at the negative one or positive one saturation. The derivative there is zero. And when the derivative is zero, there's no signal in terms of which direction you should change the weights going into that neuron to get a higher or a lower score. And so that's why you, wanna, you need to avoid the, that all your neurons are in their saturated regime at all times because then you get no signal. No signal meaning it's the same thing as saying the gradient is zero. Gradient is zero is the same as having no signal for where you should go in your optimization. Now, we say we want to be in this regime where things behave well and so forth, and we're going to initialize, and we hope it stays there um, through our optimization, does the right thing. But there's something else. This is one of the major breakthroughs last year, um, and it's called batch normalization. And the, the idea there is let's just force the thing to get, force every neuron to have a good activation level such that, as a consequence, the gradient signals are not zero. We get real signal and we can optimize well. What does that mean, practically? You have your mini batch of data. Let's say you picked 100 labeled examples. You pass your labeled example, each one of them through your neural net. As you start passing it through the first layer, at the first layer you can look at one of the neurons in the first layer, look at a single neuron. You can say, on average, how much Am I being activated? Like how, how much is, am I getting on each channel? So you look at, let's say you have 10 input channels into that neuron, you look at each channel, how much, what's the average value? You can say, I'm gonna, instead of feeding in every original signal, I'm gonna subtract out the average over the 100 data points that I have, and so now you have a zero centered input to each channel. Then you can say to get the scale right, I'm gonna look at the variance over those 100 data points that I'm looking at right now, divide by the square root of the variance, and now we're automatically in the right regime. Okay? So this is kind of funny, because we, we have our neural network. Now what's going to happen in front of each neuron, we'll have this extra calculation that we can actually only do if we feed in a bunch of data. Based on one data point, you can't do this right. You need to have, let's say, 100 data points being fed in in parallel into the neural net, and then at each unit, you look along each incoming channel, what's the average of the signal that comes in, subtract it out, divide by the square root of the variance. And you need to do this sequentially, right? Because if you change the calculation in the beginning by subtracting out the mean, dividing by square root of the variance, then the output of the neuron will change, and so that will affect what you need to do on the next one, and so forth. So structurally, what this would look like, this is the calculation you do, is that if here is where you start, this is your input. And if you have a fully connected layer at the beginning where all your inputs go to all the neurons, um, you would have the computation here in principle of your um, W transpose f of x. But then before you pass things through your tan age, you make sure you batch normalize, which means you work this transformation on your inputs and then accordingly then have the transformed thing be used that's being passed through the tan age. Then again, you do your matrix multiplies, look at the averages and so forth. You do your batch normalization and this repeats over and over. So at this point, you're just forcing the thing to be in the right regime. And that makes it work a lot better. This is just something that was done quite recently, but at this point, that's kind of a given. Almost everybody uses this for all their training. Okay, so here's some more details. Um, one thing to keep in mind is you might say, well, do I really want this thing? Because now everything is always going to be zero centered. It's always 
going to be rescaled in this particular way. Well, you could say by default I'm going to do that, but I give it one extra degree of freedom. After this calculation here that normalizes, I allow another rescaling and another offset that you might initialize to one and to zero, but then the learning algorithm can also train those parameters for each neuron to still allow it to shift things and rescale things. But at least you start in a good part of the space, you're favored to be in a good part of the space, but the learning algorithm could explicitly escape it if it wants to, if that's relevant, okay? All right, this is what this looks like computationally. This is what the pseudocode is. Um, what I want to do in the remainder part is talk about how we compute gradients. So, so far we've assumed that somebody provides us with a gradient and then we're going to use momentum or standard gradient descent to step in that direction and repeat. Maybe we do batch, mini batches and so forth. But ultimately we've assumed that we know how to get that. We actually don't know how to get that. Well, we kind of do. I mean, one way we could do it is say, well, we know derivatives are just the limit of a finite difference. So you could say, if you want a derivative with respect to a variable x of my function f at my current point x, I just perturb it by a little bit, plus h, take the difference, divide by h, and that's how you could compute a derivative. So imagine you have your big neural net, a billion parameters. You want to compute your gradient, which is your a billion dimensional vector. You could cycle through each of your parameters give each of them a small bump, take the difference, and there is your finite difference-based gradient calculation. That's expensive, right? You'd have to do, if you do this naively, you'd have to do a, if you have a billion parameters, a billion forward props to compute those billion variations, and then take the differences, of course, and there, there is your vector. So now computing a gradient would be a billion times more expensive than just computing one forward prop, which is uh, a very high cost to pay. So, but in principle you can do this. It is interesting to keep this in mind. Um, as you write code and you say, oh, I have a better way to compute gradients because I can maybe do some math and here's like a nice expression for the gradient. Maybe you make some mistakes in your math, right? Or maybe you had the math right but then you typed it into your code, there was a mistake. And that might be hard to spot and a standard way to spot this is by also implementing this. Of course, you wouldn't run it on a huge neural net, you run it on something small. And then on the small thing, you check your code, you make sure the numerical, this finite difference gradient matches whatever you did analytically. And if that matches, then you can be comfortable, hopefully, that your analytical calculation was correct and was implemented correctly. So it's a good way to sanitize, check things, not to actually do things. Now what else can we do? Like, you can compute a gradient, finite differences. You can do a lot of tedious math, or hope that Mathematica maybe does like, Tedious math for you and like a, you know, it's like a billion parameters and it will work through it for you. Um, might be pretty difficult for it to do. Um, any thoughts on what else we can do? So there's something called automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation, what it does is you write a piece of code that is just effectively the forward propagation in the neural net. You add a little bit in every neuron, and we'll tell you more about what that little bit is that you add. And once you add that, you can actually do a backward traversal in your neural net to find out your gradient. And it costs about the same as the forward pass. So in about the same cost, you want you to do one forward pass, then a backward pass, which is very similar to the forward pass in terms of computational cost, you actually get out your gradient. And the truth is this applies to pretty much anything. You think of, let's say, TensorFlow as a neural net library. Another way to think of it is TensorFlow is a library that allows you to compute gradients. No matter what code you write, it doesn't have to be a neural net code. You could write any kind of piece of code you've been writing already. You might have written a piece of code for whatever, CS61A. You put some free parameters in there that you say, oh, I want these parameters to be optimized in some way. Then you write it in TensorFlow rather than whatever you wrote it in already and then you define an objective and now TensorFlow will find gradients with respect to that objective. You can optimize your code automatically. It works for essentially everything. So what do we need as the tool underneath? A computation graph. So we'll think of functions now as computation graphs. That's our basic entity. Here's a very simple computation graph. Um, you have x and w. There's a multiplication here. Then there's some hinge loss which is Effectively, the, the rectifier thing, it does this to the number, and then we add something here, and then there is some kind of 
value that comes out, the loss that we're trying to minimize. Okay? This could be very big computation graphs. AlexNet has, is, is huge. I believe had about 60 million parameters in there. Um, this is another thing called a neural Turing machine. Anybody heard of that? Something oh, over there, a couple of hands. Um, invented by uh, Alex Graves and collaborators at DeepMind. Um, what is it? What's a Turing machine? A Turing machine is a general computational device. It's something that has an input tape, an output tape, and can compute anything that's computable if you program it right. Okay? This neural Turing machine, what is that? It's a Turing machine with the code that runs the Turing machine left parameterized. So you don't have to write a code, it's just a bunch of params. Just like in a neural net, you don't choose all the weights. The weights are left open for training data to determine what they should be. In the neural Turing machine, you have this blob of code that's just a bunch of parameters sitting there. And then you give it example inputs to your program, example outputs, and then it trains itself to become a program that does that. So you might give it a list and a sorted list, another list and a sorted version of that list. Over time, it'll figure out how to train itself to become a sorter. Um, you might have something, people have done this with addition, you might feed it two numbers and then show it the sum. Over time, it figures out how to do addition, multiplication, things like that. It's not that this works for everything, like you can't just, for every future programming thing you're gonna do, download a neural Turing machine and expect that you can just train it to do what you want it to do, but things might be headed in that direction, who knows? It's definitely an interesting proof of concept that has been made uh, with this work. But this thing is huge. So many derivatives to compute. You really don't want to do this by hand. So we want this auto diff approach. Okay, so let's think about what this auto diff can do in a simple example. So here's our computation graph. We have three inputs. We have an output, f. Okay. We want to know the derivative. What we're interested in is derivative of f with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, derivative with respect to z. That's our gradient, right? We have a function. All the, the derivatives composed together is the gradient factor. That's what we want, okay? How do we find that? So let's look at some things here. We'll call this quantity here Q, okay? Q is X plus Y, okay? Then DQ DX is one, DQ DY is one, all right? Easy to compute. That's all local. That's local to this unit over here. Keep that in mind. We're just looking at derivatives that are local to the unit. F is Q times Z, right? That's what this thing does. Q coming from here, Z from here. Derivative of F with respect to Q is Z. F with respect to Z is Q. Again, just local derivatives. We're not looking at global derivatives here, only locally in each unit. We look at what the derivatives are with respect to its inputs, okay? Derivative of the output of the unit with respect to its inputs. What we want is these. Not all of those are present yet. This, we need to do more work, okay? We can start computing this. We start in the back. Derivative of f with respect to f is one. That's our base case, okay? Then we work our way back. We say, how about f with respect to z? Well, we know that's equal to q. What was q for this data point? We actually have q, because we did a forward pass, q was three. So I actually know this is going to be three. We can fill that in. Okay, we can then work our way back here. Okay, derivative with respect to q of f, well, we know that that's locally known that is equal to z. What was z? z was negative four. So we can fill in negative four over there. Then we look at the next unit here, the plus unit. Take derivatives to that. What is the derivative of f with respect to y? That's what we want to find there. Well, we already have the derivative of f with respect to q and y goes into q. So we just effectively apply the chain rule here and we say, f respect to y is f respect to q, q with respect to y. And so what do we have for q with respect to y? That is one, and so we multiply one with f respect to q, which is this thing here, negative four. So we have one times negative four, which gives us negative four. And then similarly for x, df dx, apply the chain rule. Chain rule says it's df dq, dq dx. Note that this thing actually corresponds to how this graph is structured. It's saying that to compute the derivative somewhere towards the front of the graph, it depends on everything downstream from it multiplied together. That's what's happening here. We know what these are and we can fill in the product and we have negative four. This is an example, but this example illustrates how this works in general. 
You do a forward pass, fill in the numbers in the forward pass, and it can do local computations in every unit to find out derivatives as you work your way back. This is very methodical. You can write a piece of code to do this for you. You just need a piece of code for a plus unit, a piece of code for a multiplier unit, and you can compose it in an incredibly complex network. It doesn't matter how complex the graph is, you can make this work. Okay, so this is what it generally looks like. You have some function in a node in your graph. There is an output, and in this case, two input channels. You want dz dx, you want dz dy. That's what's living inside f, right? That's the local gradient. You have the loss function that you care about. That's what recursively comes in from here. You have the loss, the derivative of the loss with respect to z coming in from there. And then to get that with respect to x and y, you need to apply this thing over here. You apply the chain rule and you compute dl dx this way and similarly dl dy. And this is totally general. Any function f could be sitting there. All you need to supply with f is in addition to what you do for the forward pass, you need the local derivative with respect to its inputs. So the derivative of the output with respect to its inputs. That's all you need. And now you can start composing any, any functions in a directed acyclic graph. You can do the forward prop, very easy. Backward prop, equally easy. Note that if you had a big graph, if you did this with, if you cared about only one derivative, let's say with respect to x, it's a huge graph, you kind of propagate to the graph, get to x. Now you care about derivative with respect to y, propagate to the graph, there'll be a lot of repeat calculation. So you're sharing a lot of computation when you compute derivatives here, because you propagate to the graph only once, but you get derivatives in one propagation with respect to all the parameters that you want derivatives with respect to. So that's pretty amazing. Of course, and this repeats over here, keeps going backwards in the graph. Let's look at another example. So here is a slightly more complex thing. There's an exponentiation in there, not just multiplications and additions. So what's going on here, we have a function f, which depends on x and w. x are our inputs, w is the weight factor. Um, and so we have that all set up over here. We have a weight factor and our inputs. The green is what happens in the forward propagation. We start with that, then we multiply here, we add, we add something else, we multiply again, we exponentiate, we add something else and then we do one over x on that input. That's the forward prop of this uh, calculation here. Backward pass, what do we need? We need derivatives in each of those individual units, right? So we need to, for each of those units, for example, one over x, we need to know derivative of the output of that unit with respect to its inputs. There's only one input, and so we have the f dx is minus one over x squared if f of x equals one over x. For the exponent, exponentiation, the one living here, fx equal e to the x, that's the derivative, and so forth. So we need to put that in each one of those units, what the derivative is. Once we've done that, we can start the backward pass. We start in the back, we look at what it is, we apply it, and we know what has to be put on the incoming channel, which is now passed back to the next one, and we can repeat this over and over and over, where we just apply the chain rule and the local derivatives to get back out, ultimately, the derivatives of the function with respect to each of the input channels. We mostly care about the weights, we don't care about the derivatives with respect to x, then that's all we can compute, we can choose that. Um, okay, then we can use the gradient and take a step. Other things you can do is you can say, well, some blocks keep coming back. Like, if, if what you have here is an incoming signal and an outgoing signal, and you say, well, I kind of just want to treat it as one block, you can do that too. And often that can be more effective. Because rather than chaining through this and doing multiple calculations, it turns out that for a sigmoid function, this particular function over here, the derivative happens to be one minus sigma x times sigma x, which is actually more efficient to compute than if you break it down in each individual step. And so you can play these kind of tricks to optimize what you do with your computation graph to compute things more quickly.
Okay. Then what are some patterns you might notice? If there's an add gate, for example, this is an add gate, two things get added. The gradient signal that comes from here actually splits and goes both ways. So it gets distributed in two directions on the backward pass. Okay? Because those two things both contribute to what's downstream here, both of them get gradient signal coming back. Um, if there's a max gate, if you say, well, this thing computes the max of its inputs, they need to check which input achieved the max, because the input that achieved the max is the one that influenced what's downstream. And so then you would say, okay, it's the thing that achieved the max to which I feed the gradient that's coming to me, and the other thing gets zero gradient because it didn't influence the outcome, and changing it will not change the outcome, and so you get something that in this case is zero here and two over here, right? Multiplier gate does something else, it's kind of crossing in some way, uh, but each gate has its own properties, but ultimately the math is very, very simple. You just need these local derivatives, apply the chain rule, pass things backwards through that graph. Okay? It could also be that things uh, branch, in which case gradients get added up. So you could have that this thing goes to two places, and then it gets a gradient signal from both, and then you'll see that that adds up. You get the sum of both contributing to what's going out back this way. This is what it looks like in code, kind of very simple code. You have this computational graph object. You do a forward pass based on your inputs. You store some information along the way, right? Otherwise, you can't do your backward pass because it's using all the numbers that were computed in the forward pass. Sometimes you have to store something a little extra um, depending on what your derivatives are like. Um, but you know for each node what the derivatives are, so you know for each node what it needs to store to be able to do the backward pass. And then in reverse topological order, Make your backward pass, get out your full gradient. Okay? So a multiply gate could look like this. Forward pass says the output z is x times y. The backward pass, which will compute the derivative with respect to z, would be looking at whatever is the derivative um, coming in, that you apply the chain rule, and you get out derivative dx dy. So this is what you'd have to fill in here to define what your calculation is. Okay, so this particular case, what we fill in is dx with respect to dx is we need this quantity over here. The derivative with respect to z is being passed in, and dz dx for x times y is y, and that's what's sitting over here, okay? So every node, instead of just having this, now also has this component over here. Okay, let's uh, give you an overview of where you can actually most easily do this uh, when you do this in practice. One thing is TensorFlow. That's a computation graph framework that allows you to code nodes like that and put them together, and then you can ask for a forward pass, a backward pass. This will be part of your project six, still being built, uh, hopefully finished building in the near future. Um, Theano is another framework like this. It's actually an earlier one that um, has been around longer, very popular. Um, it's out of the University of Montreal. TensorFlow is out of Google. Theano is out of the University of Montreal, the Osho Benjos group. Um, essentially the same philosophy. It's all about having this generic framework where you can define computation graphs, and hence you can then do forward passes and backward passes. Torch, this is uh, the one that uh, Facebook tends to use. Um, the first two are, are, if you use Python, the first two are Python effectively as you use them. Um, there might be some C code underneath sometimes, but Python is how you'd use it. Torch is in Lua, which is a game programming language. Not as many people know that language, but that's what they use to build Torch. Um, and so that's another option. That's what Facebook AI Research Group uses. Cafe, um, that's actually built at Berkeley. It's one of the most widely used ones in deployed systems out there. And it's built in Trevor Darrell's group here at Berkeley. Um, provides similar capabilities. I mean, they're all quite comparable. It's a lot of kind of subjective choices that people make. I prefer this one or that one. And then this one here, CGT, is another one out of Berkeley. This was built uh, by some of my students and kind of 
is extremely similar in spirit to TensorFlow, but was built uh, before TensorFlow. For your project six, we chose TensorFlow because we think all of these are good, but if we had to choose one, it just seems like somehow the one that maybe most likely you, you'd work with going forward, they're all pretty likely, but if any one of them is more likely, um, we thought TensorFlow is also because Google is putting a lot of support behind it. Um, it seems likely that'd be around for a while. And so that's why we picked TensorFlow, um, but that's, that's just a choice. If you had very strong feelings and you think these other ones are the way to go, um, I I'd be welcoming you to re completely recode your project six and um, do it in one of the other ones if you'd like. I don't think it's easy to do. I think it would be a lot of work, but if you have strong feelings about that, um, that's okay. Some people do have very strong feelings about which ones to use. All right, that's it for today. See you on Tuesday.